I'm going to start off. I just I want to thank you guys all for coming tonight. I enjoy doing what I do here. In fact, it's quite a passion. It's my passion in life, and I'll tell you why. Um, I started out when I was 18 years old as a registered nurse. I was actually a nursing student at 18. In the first time, and anybody wants to get up and move about, don't feel like you have to sit there. If you get restless, I get restless. I don't sit well when these things. So if you need to stand and move, I will not in the least bit be offended. And also if you have questions, don't hesitate to stop me because I like to answer questions when people have them. Because most of the time somebody else has that same question. But when I went into the hospital my very first day as a nursing student, um, I was given a patient to take care of for two days who he was on, and I don't remember this completely now, but it was either his second or his third heart attack. And I remember at 18, you know, it's my first time in the hospital taking care of a patient, and I remember thinking I was horrified when I had to bring him his breakfast, and then a few hours later I had to bring him his lunch. I was absolutely horrified with what I was feeding, giving this man to eat. Um, I knew there was nothing. Hospital food is notoriously like, the worst food on the planet next to school and nursing homes. And they're all kind of like right there lumped together. But I was horrified because I knew, God, this man is on his second or third heart attack, and how can this in any way be helping him? How can it be nourishing to him, heal him, whatever? I mean, at 18, I didn't really have all the words in my head. Looking back now, I know what I was thinking. And I also, it was in the times when, believe it or not, you could still smoke in the hospital. So I had to put him, shut off his oxygen and wheel him down to the waiting room and open the window and he could sit there and smoke cigarettes. Anyhow, um, I remember going home that night and I called my mom. I was at a SUNY two-year college that was 45 minutes from where I grew up in Brazier Falls. I was at SUNY Ganton. And I called my mom and I said, I'm, I'm done. I can't do this. I hate nursing school. And she said, fine, pack your stuff up. I'll be up in 45 minutes to pick you up, which was stunning to me because I thought she was going to give me this hard time and say, you can't quit and you got to do this. And I, so I just simply said to my mom, okay, yeah, okay, whatever mom thinks. Uh, goodbye, I'll be fine. And I stuck it out. I did, I did hate nursing school. I'm not going to lie to you there. I hated nursing school because I knew innately what we were doing wasn't healing for people. And I, I, I had a path. I wasn't completely aware of that path. But after I had worked in nursing for a year, I was done with medical surgical nursing because it was, it was picking up the pieces of what people had done to their lives um, themselves. And when I say these things, I'm not being critical in any way, so don't think, oh, you know, she's pointing a finger at me or she's really negative. I'm not being critical of anybody's lifestyle choices and habits. I'm only telling you what I experienced, the reality of it. I knew I couldn't do this forever. And so... I knew I needed to get on the preventative end of things, that I needed to help people prevent getting there in the hospital, seeing what they were, um, the disease that they were that they had created because of their lifestyle choices. I worked in maternity nursing for a few years before I went back to school because maternity nursing was positive, it was great. They used those moms, we were teaching moms about wellness, and um, so that was a whole lot better option for me. And I still knew I needed to. So I went back to school at SUNY Cortland. I got my four-year degree in health education. And then I went to SU six months after that and did my master's in phys ed. Not your typical phys ed. I did it in lifetime wellness, fitness promotion. And from there, I've worked in public schools. I've done a lot of teaching in the Cortland area here and at SU as well as at Henniger High School. I was there for three and a half years. Schools in the North Country where I'm from up near Potsdam. And over the years, I have done a couple of different herbalist training programs, a Reiki master, and recently I just did a holistic health coaching program, which kind of pulled everything that I've done over the years together. And what I do working with people is I try and help them change their lifestyle by, like, you know, the lifestyle suggestions and with nutrition, fitness, all kinds of lifestyle choices. And to be their support person, um, and I do even more than that, do way beyond um, a holistic health coach type thing because of my background in nursing um, and also because of my background as an herbalist. I have a lot of people who come to me that want to get off the medications that they're on, which a holistic health coach could not help with that, but because of my nursing background, I know the herbs to put them on. I know how to I, you know, help people with 
liver disease and cancer and diabetes and all kinds of crazy things, if they're willing to change their life, and that's the thing that we want to change their life. Um, so basically that's how I got where I am now. <coughs> and I connected with Wendy, the lady who owns this store, because I just wrote a book six months ago, and it is about that. It, it, I put the book together because basically what I was teaching my clients, the basic stuff to get them going, um, what they needed to do to change their lives, and I just, I kept saying, like I was saying the same things over and over, and I'm like, I'm just going to put this in a book. And just, when they walk through my door, I'm just going to hand them the book. Just read the book, okay? Just read the book and call me. And I, my other thought was that it would it would reach more people that way than just whoever walked through the door of my house that wanted help, that I could reach more people in the world. And that I just want everybody to be better and healthy. I just want to fix everyone. Um, so that's how Wendy and I connected, and she asked me if I would come down and do workshops, and I'm like, yes, that's what I've been doing. Absolutely, I would love to. Um, so what we're going to talk to you about today is basically whole foods, but we'll get off on tangents about other things to do with lifestyle choices. And like I said, ask questions, because what I'm doing here is I write down the things that you talk about. And besides the slideshow that I'll send to you via email, I will also send you different educational handouts that pertain to your questions that will like, further answer your questions, um, give you information to help you out in the choices that you're trying to make for yourself. And I'll shoot those all off to you tomorrow. So, this is a picture on the front of my book, and it's a special picture because it signifies, stands for, you know, a few different things for me. One is gratitude and also abundance. And the hands that are holding that are my two sons, one on either side. And my motto is, an apple a day keeps the doctor away, and I truly mean that. And it's not just the apple, it's the whole food part of it. Um, and it's all about gratitude and abundance for those things that we have in life. And so that's kind of become my, my symbol. Picture of the book. Um, whole foods. When I say the word whole foods, and I expect participation here, I'm going to ask questions, you will have a quiz, and if you want to leave this room tonight, you have to answer my questions. Um, when I say whole foods to you, somebody tell me what I mean by that. Everybody tell me. <laughs> All of it. All of it. Seeds and an apple. The whole thing. Fruits and vegetables. Grains. Non-processed. Although non-processed process, kind of extend that out a little bit. What you mean by that? Okay. Organic. What's that? Organic. Natural. Meaning what? Not modified in any way. And what would you do to modify it? What do we do to foods to modify them? We do. We dump chemicals all over them. If we process them, in order to use grains as flowers, you do have to process them. But as long as you don't do something, cooking foods is processing them. So a little bit of processing is okay in, in certain things that we do, but there's certain things we do when we process it that makes it not okay. Picking your brain. Adding. Okay? Adding. Adding things to it that weren't meant to be there. Which, on the opposite side, that's right, taking things away. And when we, we'll, I'll talk about whole grain flour um, when we get there. Um, but there's so many things that we do to food that we put things in that weren't meant to be there. We take things out. We create food products out of substances here on this planet that were never meant to be ingested. So that's what we're going to talk about is whole foods and why whole foods are important. I throw this one on here <laughs> because this is the typical American breakfast. And, and truthfully speaking, more people live on this type of thing, coffee and some sort of pastry type thing in the morning, than most other breakfasts. And that's a sad state of affairs, but it is the case. But at the same time, I also say to people, you can do this in a healthy way. You know, you get good organic coffee, um, and you can make donuts out of complete whole food. And I do, on occasion, make them for my kids. I teach baking classes in the hometown where I, in, in the Potsdam area. I teach baking classes on making pies, cakes, cookies, um, any of those types of treat foods, donuts being one, with 100% whole food. And um, 
So you can do that with donuts. And I, I do make them for my kids on occasion, but it's a lot of work. That fryer, that fryer fat splattering all over my stove. <laughs> um, but you can. Any food can be made whole. This picture here has significance. It is a human body cell. Why would I throw that up here? Absolutely. Everything we eat affects our cells. And you know, it's funny because most people don't think of it that way. And most physicians do not think. Any physicians in here? Before I start being bad. <laughs> because I just, as I was on my way down here today, I had a girlfriend call me. And she's an acupuncturist where I live, and she's on the phone, and I answer the phone, she goes, are you on the road right now? I said, yes, and she goes, okay, good luck in Syracuse today. Do you have time to talk? And I said, yeah, what's up, Shelby? And she said, I just had this patient in here, and I just had to vent about it. I said, okay, what's up? She's in here, she's got colitis, diverticulitis, and irritable bowel syndrome, and she's telling me when she leaves my office, she's going to Ogdensburg, which is about a half an hour from us, she's going to Ogdensburg so she can get two dozen fried donuts, because this guy in Ogdensburg makes the best fried donuts, and her husband eats the two dozen over the course of the weekend. And she said, I am so pissed right now, because she comes here every week, she spends 60 bucks on acupuncture, and she's wasting her money because she won't do the dietary things that I tell her she needs to do. And what does she think those greasy, disgusting donuts are going to do in her colon? Deep breath, Shelby. Take a deep breath. I deal with this all the time. I know, I know, and I, I said, just don't push her away because what you are doing with acupuncture is at least helping. It's reducing the inflammation. It's going to make that woman move along in the world a little bit longer than what she would. But this was the thing that she said. I said, can't you just throw in some little dietary advice? Put her on my car or something. I don't know. Mail it to her anonymously. No, no, because she said to me, everything I have is genetic, and it doesn't matter. The doctor told me it doesn't matter what you eat. It has nothing to do with that. It's your genetics really? It doesn't matter what you eat. Okay, who's the doctor? Because I need to talk to this person first of all. Of course it matters what we eat. And I throw the human body cell up here because your body cells every day are reproducing. They're splitting and dividing from the time you are conceived until the time you die. Whether it's skin cells, hair cells, toenail cells, liver cells, lungs, they are reproducing every day. And they only reproduce their health level based upon the food you put in your body. And if I explain it, let's get rid of this. If you just think, like there's this line across here, there's this imaginary line, and it's your body humming along at homeostasis, which is what your body likes to do. It likes to keep everything at an even keel. Over here, if your health cells are moving in this direction as they reproduce, they're moving towards death, disease and death. If they're moving in this direction, they're moving towards health, wellness, vibrancy. When you put food in your body, if you put whole foods in your body, your cells are always going to replicate at the present health that they're in or healthier. They're always going to move in this direction because that's what your body wants to do. It wants to be healthy. If you put refined foods into your body, anything's been added to it, the nature didn't mean to be there, anything's been taken away from it, the nature meant for to be in there anything processed, packaged, product, food products, your body cells are slowly but surely moving in this direction. Every time they replicate, you're creating degenerative body cells. Degenerative body cells are what create degenerative disease. There's nothing like any more magical about it than that. That is what degenerative diseases are. And they're just moving in that direction. Now, it doesn't happen overnight. That's why people don't notice the effects of the food they're eating because it takes years of abuse of things that weren't meant to be in your body to get to that point where you actually say, I have a degenerative disease, and then you're told that it has nothing to do with what you've done in your life, it has nothing to do with the food you put in your body. I'm going to tell you different. Um, and with that said, you know, I did a workshop yesterday at Clarkson University, and I had this woman when I was going in, hey, Paula, what are you doing here? And I said, I'm doing a wellness workshop, and she said, she goes, you're the diet doctor of doom. You know, you always like, take things away from us. Can't have my soda. Can't have this. Can't have that. And I said, really, Jane? I said, let's look at this in a different way. How about this? Think about what I invite into your life. I'm not telling you 
that you have to take these things out. You do whatever you want with that. What I'm asking you to do is add these things into your life. To be adding whole foods into your life, and when you do, you know you're going to feel better. And when you feel better, you're going it, to—it's just going to be like this snowball effect. You're going to do better things all the time because every time you do something that makes you feel better, you're going to want to feel even better. And you start feeling good because of whole foods, and then you want to start moving more. You want to start being outside more because it feels good. And all of these things build up to where you just make yourself feel healthier. And a perfect example of this is my kids were at their dad's over the weekend, and my youngest son, he loves eating out. And it's, to me, it's a nightmare eating out because there's not a whole lot of places you can go to get good food. And he woke his dad up Sunday morning and told him he wanted to go to breakfast, which I rarely take them to breakfast, and I'm very strict. I hate to use that word, but I'm very strict about what they can get out in public for breakfast because most breakfast food is garbage. It's white flour pancakes with corn syrup, fake maple syrup on it white bread, French toast, and it, it's all it's a, you know, cell degeneration. You know, I, I, like, I sit there thinking, oh my God, my kids are killing themselves. So I tell them they can't. They can have a vegetable omelet, they can have oatmeal, but that's it. You cannot have that stuff. Well, dad, just let them have whatever they want. So they went out to dinner, or out to breakfast, and I didn't catch them before they left because I would have said, no, you can't. <laughs> Don't do that. Or at least like be a little bit more conscious about what, you sh what your kids are ordering. So anyhow, he said to me, Mom, it was awful. He told me where they went in downtown Pasco. It was awful. It was the worst breakfast food I ever had. They had the cheapest of cheap fake syrups made out of corn syrup that tasted worse than any I've ever had, and it was just really bad. And I said, well, why don't you just push the plate away, get up, and go home? And eat good food that you had at home. Well, we were there, and Dad paid for it. And so the next morning, he has to get up for school. And he gets up, and he gets out of bed, and he says, I feel awful. I have a really bad headache. This doesn't ever feel bad. I said, you do, huh? Really? I said, why, why do you think that is? I don't know. I said, really? I want you to think back about 24 hours. Oh, that crappy breakfast I ate. That's right. And I said, you know what? I'm glad you got a headache. In fact, I hope you have that headache all day long. And the next time you want Dad to take you out for breakfast, think about that headache. Because you'll remember the one time you've been to McDonald's in your life and you puked. Remember that too, honey, because you've never asked to go back there again. So good. I'm glad you got a headache. Get up, get moving. And he just looked at me and he goes, you're so mean. No, I'm not. Because it's a lesson. And you have a food hangover. And you're going to be fine. Don't do it again. And it, it's a perfect reminder. I said, you know what? Most people feel that way every day. And they don't realize it because they feel low-level sick every day. Constant chronic headaches, tired, body aches. They feel that way every day and they think it's just because I'm getting old or whatever. You know now that you feel good every day. So don't eat that stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So this picture here, and I like to explain body cell thing and then the nutritional savings account. I explain it in both ways because then it hits home with people. Um, your body is a savings account of nutrients. And when you put nutrients into your body, when you put whole foods into your body, what happens is, take a bite of an apple, your body is genetically connected to the food you eat. And if it's natural food, your body knows what is, what's in your mouth. When you start chewing it, your body knows what that is. And it's sending messages to your brain, you've got an apple coming, you know, get ready to digest some fiber and carbohydrates and stuff. Then the food hits your stomach. Your body knows immediately what to do with it because it's a real food. It connects with its genetics. It knows how to digest it. It moves it through your system, digests it, and it deposits the nutrients in it into your cells. Whatever it doesn't need to use at that given time. If you put something into your body, and I could use a multitude of things, Dunkin' Donuts, donuts for breakfast, most of the ingredients in that are really refined, and then there's things in there that aren't even food. They're some sort of laboratory-created additive that they throw in. Your body has no idea what that is. Even refined flour, your body doesn't recognize it because it's not there in its whole state. So the message to the brain is already like, uh, I'm not sure what's going on here, not sure what's in there. Then it gets to your gut. Your gut has no idea what to do with it because it's not whole food. And in order to process it out, it still has to go through the whole digestive process. It still has to move through, come out your colon. All of that has to happen. 
But if the nutrients that were meant to be in there, if it was a whole food, are not there, they have to come from somewhere to digest it because the digestive process itself takes up nutrients. If it's not in the food, it's coming from somewhere, and it pulls. It withdraws from your body cells. It withdraws from your tissues, you know, whatever. Whatever tissues it withdraws from. A perfect example is people who drink a lot of soda. If you drink a lot of soda, that pulls minerals from your bones and your teeth. You get cavities. You get osteoporosis because it upsets the mineral balance in your body. And in order to balance that back out, it pulls the minerals from your bones to balance things back out. And if over the years you keep pulling things out of your tissues instead of putting it back in, you end up with degenerative organs, degenerative bones, you know, wherever it is that it's pulling from. And different people have different things. That's why some people end up with osteoporosis and arthritis. Some people end up with diabetes. Some people end up with cardiovascular disease. Some people end up with all of them. Um, but you're just, you're pulling out. You're just slowly putting your body into a process of degeneration. With that said, the upbeat side of it, I always like to, I'm not the doom person, Jane said I was, the upbeat side of it, although she called me this morning and she did say, I am being so much more conscious of what I'm eating now. I can't believe it. You, you know, you ruined my life. <laughs> and I said, but do you feel better? Yes, I do, but, you know, I still want my soda. Slow step, slow step. The upside of it is when we do put our body into this degeneration like that, you can turn that around. All you have to do is start living that whole health lifestyle again, eating whole foods, and your body cells will turn around. And you'll basically pull yourself out of that degenerative disease. Most diseases can be healed. I would like to say all, but there are sometimes some people have pushed their immune system so far that it, the, the immune system is just too weak to kick in and do what it needs to do to help heal the body. And those people are the ones that are just going to succumb to the to death from degeneration. Some people who have cancer, you know, they'll survive, others won't. Doing nothing but natural. And it, it, it just depends on how far your body has gone, how far your immune system has gone, whether it, it can do the job to heal. Um, what does it mean to be eating whole foods? And I like to point people in the direction, and I will tell you this, you know, Take the information, work it into your life where it works for you, find your own truth, change things as it, as it works for you. You don't have to do everything overnight, bang, um, because it's a lot. One of those ladies that was here this is, um, at noon for the workshop, she just said, wow, that's a lot. Wow, that's a lot of stuff going around in my head right now. I said, are you overwhelmed? She said, oh, no, no, I'm not overwhelmed, but I'm really, it's a lot of stuff that I have to think about now, and like, how am I going to make these changes in my life? One slow step at a time. Don't, you know, don't freak yourself out about it. Although I've had some, I mean, I've, I've worked with clients for a year and a half, and it's like I can't believe, oh my God, are you putting me a year and a half later, and we're still, we're still stuck in this? And then I've had others. I had one gentleman call me up. This was at the beginning of the summer, and he said to me, um, I read your book, and it, it, the book is really easy. You could literally read it in just a couple of hours. It's a quick, fun read. Um, he said, I read your book, and I gave it to my wife. And she stayed up till midnight. He said, you've got to come over to my house right now. She stayed up till midnight last night. She read the book, and then she tore the kitchen apart. And she's gotten everything out of the cupboard that was, and that's the way I do things. I'm all or nothing. I'm not this one thing at a time. One thing. All or nothing. She's torn the kitchen apart. She's got boxes all over the kitchen floor of all these food products. And I have no idea what to do with them because I know now, and I feel guilty. I don't want to take them to the food bank because if I'm not going to eat them, why do I want to give them to someone else? And I... I'm, you know, like, I don't know, Rich, I don't know what to tell you. You know, that's your conscience. You've got to figure that out yourself. You need to come over here and help because my wife has to go shopping. We have nothing to eat in the house, and we need to help her figure out what she's going to go buy. <laughs> okay, okay. That is, some people function that way. Some people, it's that one little change at a time, one thing a week. Um, we'll go through all these, the local, seasonal, organically grown, naturally raised, home cooked, what is that? What are all these things? What does it mean? The local thing, um, how local is local? You know, northeast region is local. Tropical fruit, it's not local. Um, with that said, I'm not going to tell you never eat a banana again. Um, seasonal, because it's in sync with nature, and we'll talk about that. The organic and the peelings, 
all of that we will cover. Those are just questions for you to have kind of in your mind. Um, the seasonal thing. If you think about how you feel in the spring, usually we're all, you know, the winter's over, we've got all this energy, um, we want to get outside. Our energy is very upward moving. This is traditional Chinese medicine and actually Ayurvedic Indian medicine would say this as well. Very upward moving energy in the spring. Everything is in the spring. Plants are. If you think about how plants grow in the spring, everything is just crazy growing fast. And that's the way our energy is. And when we eat the food that's growing in that season, it nourishes our body because the energy is the same. And I put these pictures up here because if any of you have grown asparagus in the backyard, you can look at it one afternoon and then go back out the next morning and it's grown a foot. That is fast-moving energy. And that's what we need to be nourishing our body with at that time of year. In the summertime, you know, summertime is a good time. It's warm. It's hot a lot and it can be dry. And the foods that we are given to eat in the summertime are those really fleshy, juicy things that are perfect for what we need in the summertime. It feeds our body with the right energy, the right um, moisture for that time of year. And like I've had clients who say to me, you know, it's the middle of winter, I can't understand why I'm not losing weight. That's all I eat is salad. Bingo! You're not meant to be eating salads, green salads in the middle of the winter. Sure, it's healthy in the summer, but in the middle of the winter, you're eating very cooling, moist foods that cool your body down, that cools your um, metabolic rate down. It's cooling you down. And so when you cool yourself down like that, you're not doing what your body needs in the winter. Your body needs to be warmed in the winter. And you're not going to lose weight. Do you have greens growing in your backyard in the middle of the winter? I don't think so. Why are you eating them that have come from California or Florida? Eat foods that are going to feed the energy of the season, and your body will respond with balanced weight, balanced um, health. Fall and winter veggies are very, the energy turns inward again. And root vegetables, squash, um, cabbages, they're all inward focused energy. And that's what we do in the winter time, fall and winter, you know, we all kind of come back into ourselves. We're not as expansive anymore. We're in, you know, introverted. We spend more time indoors. We need warming, inward energy foods, and that's what these foods are. Um, yeah? Yes? If there are things you've grown and preserved, you know, you've kept to use it, absolutely use them. I mean, I wouldn't tell you not to. Um, we definitely do better when we're eating those fall and winter storage. Yeah. Right. I mean, if you think about it, 150, 200 years ago, you couldn't eat broccoli all winter because it wouldn't stay. What we kept were those vegetables that you could cold storage or squash in warm storage, cabbage. Those things would stay all winter long and you could eat them. You wouldn't be able to eat strawberries all, unless you dried them. And people did dry strawberries and eat them in soups and stews and stuff. Um, but I'm not going to tell you not to do that because you grew them. Eat them. That's a good thing. Um, root veggies. A couple of things about root veggies. Healing, and, and this goes into the organic thing as well as the nutrient content of root vegetables. Most people peel everything and toss the peelings out. If you're tossing the peelings into your compost pile and it's going back into your garden, that's great. If you're peeling everything and you're throwing those peelings out, you're losing a lot of nutrients because if you think about where they're growing, those root vegetables live in the ground. They're growing by drawing nutrients into the root, which is the part that you're eating. So the most of the minerals and nutrients are in the skin and directly underneath the skin. And when you're putting that away, you're losing that unless you're putting it in your compost. That's, that's good. Um, I read somewhere at one point in time about uh, this physician who worked with people. He was, he was trying to figure out why some cultures were healthier and others were unhealthy and, and dietary related patterns and that kind of thing. And one of the things that he noticed in, in um, in countries where it was women were more subservient in 
they were in the kitchen doing the cooking, serving the men, but they were in the kitchen. They did their eating in the kitchen. The men, you know, they, they ate separately. That the women in the kitchen were peeling everything, and they were taking what was considered the best of the best to the men, the flesh of the meat, all the fruits and vegetables they peeled, and in the kitchen they were using the bones and the peeling to make themselves soup stocks and stuff, and that's what they were eating, and they lived longer. And they were trying to figure out why these women lived longer, because they were getting more minerals from using the peelings and using the bones. Um, the other thing about people always say to me, well, I peel them because I don't, I don't buy organic, so I'm peeling them to get the pesticides off them. Here we go. You know, I, I, I don't like like knocking everybody's positive, like what they think they're doing is positive, like knocking the rug out from underneath or whatever. If you if if plants are grown with pesticides, it's in every cell of that pesticide. It can't not be. I mean, if you think about it, you've got an apple tree and you spray that apple tree, it's all over the apples. It goes into their skin. If I spray chemicals on your skin, it's not just going to sit there. And six months from now, I tell you to wash your skin to get the chemicals off. It's gone. It's in every cell of your body at this point in time. You can't wash that off. If and then it's on the ground and it's being sucked up by the roots of the tree. So it's they're being pulled up into the tree, nourishing the whole tree. You can't get rid of that. It's just it's going nowhere but into what you're eating. Same thing with root vegetables in the ground. One of the worst root vegetables to buy, conventionally grown, is potatoes because they are sprayed with herbicides, fungicides, pesticides of all kinds during the growing season. And then at the end of the growing season when they want to harvest them, potatoes have to be dug. If you've ever watched a big potato farm and the machines rolling down the field to harvest them, it's an amazing thing. But in order to do that, they need the top plants dead because they harvest better. They spray a crap out of potato fields to top kill, to kill all of those plants on top because if they're dead, they can scoop the potatoes up much more easily. So now you've got everything that was sprayed on them during the growing season and all the chemicals that are sprayed on them to top kill. So potatoes are one of those ones that you, yeah, you want to do organically. And it's all being, you, you can't wash that off. If they're absorbed and they've grown in that, it's grown into the cells of that plant. You can't, you can't wash that off. You can get surface residues off, but you just can't clean those chemicals out of it. It's, it's impossible. Sure. Mm -mm. No, no. I mean, surface residues, it will. But see, people want to feel good. They want to feel safe about their food. Oh, you don't want chemicals on your food? Well, here, we'll create a product that washes it off. But nobody tells you you can't wash it off every cell. I mean, you just can't. I mean, think about human beings. We have a lot of topical medications that affect us sim um, systemically. If you put cardiac medication on your skin, female hormones, I mean, there's a multitude that you put on your skin. How is that going? If it can't get through your skin, it's not going to work systemically. It does. Anything that has a skin, skin is, the skin is permeable. It goes in. That's just how it works. So to say you can wash it off, that's nice, and it makes people feel good, but it's, it's not happening. Whenever there is a need in our culture, manufacturers love to rise to the occasion and create the product that solves the problem because it's a money maker. I mean, I, there, I could go into a million of them. That was the workshop I did yesterday at Clarkson, was in that food fashion and all the things that we do, like Greek yogurt, um, gluten-free products, and the list goes on and on. And when there is a need in our culture, it, uh, the world abounds right now with gluten-free products. 95% of them are absolute garbage. I wouldn't eat them. They're just full of filler crap. Same thing with... 95% of the Greek yogurt on the market. You know, people run out and they oh, but I eat Greek yogurt. Um, did you read the label? I can't tell you enough, read the label. Most Greek yogurt is nothing but yogurt that has been thickened with guar gum, perigeum, cellulose of one kind or another. It's not even Greek yogurt. It's been thickened by stuff. But people just see the Greek yogurt on the front. They know it's been marketed. Greek yogurt's good for me. They don't even think about it. They don't look at the other side. They don't read the ingredients. Greek yogurt, yes, I'm doing something good for myself. Probably they're not. Most of it is garbage. Um, I would like to think 
read the ingredients. Once again, read the ingredients. Yep, read the ingredients. I would like to think because it is a company that is conscientious enough to be creating an organic product that it would also be true Greek yogurt, which is nothing more than yogurt, live cultured yogurt plain that has been um, drained. So the liquid drains off and what's left is a thicker, creamier product sit. And if they've done anything more to it, if they've added anything more to that, if it's more than cultured milk, it's not Greek yogurt. It's a manufacturing product to make somebody billions of dollars because Greek yogurt is the great right now. And I, I, everybody falls for these things. It's like vitamin water. Are you kidding me? They slap a name like that on a product and every, oh, it's good for me. It's vitamin water. Really? Does anybody think beyond advertisements? Do you read the labels? Do you see what you're putting in your body? Don't buy into those fads and fashion. If it says something on the front, that's like a grabber, an attention grabber, flip it over. Read the ingredients. Because more than likely, it's not going to be something that's going to be nourishing to your body. I don't want to bother doing I that. I don't. I I do in some regards because there are people who have that, and there are other people who do value what they're doing, and they are true to what they say. And you just have to know. Like I know my farmers. I go to the farm. I want to know what they're doing, and I I don't just want to see what they're doing and see what they have in their barns. I want to have a conversation with them, and I want to because you can hear it. If you ask the right questions without directly asking, hey, what do you use for chemicals? Because they're going to say no, you know. But if you ask the right questions, what will unfold is the story of their philosophy of farming. And then you know who's a good farmer. One of the farm families that I buy a lot of my produce from, they're not organic certified. But if you ever have a conversation with these people, organic certification is great, but there's people out there who grow far better than organically. And they don't bother with the organic certification because it's a yearly process, it's expensive, and it's a lot of paperwork. And this family is beyond organic certification, it's, you know, ten times over. And I trust them. I've had the conversations with them. I know where their dedication lies. And so I feel good in, in buying lots of things from them, all kinds of produce. Um, I just kind of get in a conversation with them to begin with and, you know, asking them about their growing practices without bringing up the chemical thing, and they'll start talking to you, and you can tell by things that they say 
where their where their knowledge is. And if some people will come right out and say, Oh yeah, I use Roundup <laughs> and then you're just like, Oh, that goes in that farm stand. <laughs> you won't be buying from you. Uh, and most people like here's a perfect example of this one farm stand I stopped at. Um, and I asked him about if they what their growing practice were and he said, Oh, I don't put any chemicals on my produce. Totally against that. Then his grandson's standing there and he's saying, Well, Grandpa, you use Roundup in the road, but it, I don't let it touch the plant. Are you kidding me? Where do you think the plant's getting their nourishment? Out of the soil. You're, you're putting Roundup on the soil. It's in the plant. Okay. All right, Grandpa, some education's needed here. You know. And he honestly thought what he was doing was a good thing. He's keeping the... How can that happen? Right, and that's exactly what you know the farmer is thinking. Right, he's doing a good thing because he doesn't have to break his neck weeding those rows. And I get that gardening is hard work, very hard work. What about? Uh, no, go ahead. We'll get you both. <laughs> I'm one of them. <laughs> well, once milk has been heated to pasteurize it, it doesn't just kill off any sort of so-called pathogenic organism, but it also kills off lots of good organisms. It also kills off the enzymes and stuff. And I buy raw milk from a local farmer. In, in New York State, they do have to be um, certified to sell raw milk from their farm, and they're watched closely by the county and state health department. There is no I buy goat milk, and there is no cer certification or regulation for goat farmers. I just go to the farm. I put in my jars, and I leave. And if anybody ever asks me, I'm just getting milk for my cats and dogs. You know, I would never blow my farmer in because he's been taking good care of me for 10 years now with all kinds of stuff. But... And if it's, it's again, it's quizzing the farmer about how they do things and looking at his farm. I mean, I would sleep in his farm, in the stalls with his goat. <laughs> it is. It is. It's hard. Well, it's actually it's not hard to find. I chance to find Tom this man just literally by chance. It's not hard to find him. You just have to start asking questions of farmers when other people aren't around because the farmer will tell you, "Oh yeah, I got milk and I'll sell it to you raw," but you can't tell anyone. And if they ask, you're getting it for free, you're donating money to the farm, you bought a share. Because if you buy a share of the farm, the farm's yours. You can eat anything off that farm, raw or otherwise, because you own part of the farm. If they're raw certified to sell raw, you have to be certified to sell raw. But I chanced upon this man because I was looking for an organic dairy farm. Was in the process. I, they were revitalizing this barn, and I knew it was going to be an organic dairy farm. And I stopped to ask the farmer will I be able to buy raw milk from you because my kids have a real hard time with milk. And the guy was out there, he was working and stuff, and he goes, I don't know, they are going to be organic. I have no idea. He said, I'm a farmer from down the road. I'm just here trying to help these farmers get, get up and running. He said, I've got goats that way. Great, because I don't want cow's milk. That's exactly what I want. Can I come to your farm? And he looked at me and he goes, you want goat's milk? Yes, I do. Ten years later, I'm still buying goat's milk. Eggs, meat, produce. He's a good farmer. Oh, no. Nope. Any questions? Good. with raw cow's milk. Raw cow's milk, cow's milk tends to have um, oh, proteins and anti 
antigens in it that can be irritating to some people's system and where you would notice it is in your joints. And so the, the easiest way to do it is just, if you've been off it for a while, introduce it back into your system, see what it does. If you feel lousy, get rid of it. Um, it's just playing a game really with your body. I have a gentleman who, who went off gluten because of his arthritis and literally in two weeks after being off gluten, his arthritis pain that he's had for years was gone. And he, he went along with it for a couple of months and then he said, you know what, I'm just going to check this out. He started throwing some wheat back into his diet and he said he was waking up in the morning with just the burning pain in his joints, ache that just stiff, hard to get going. And he said, that's it. it just, it's like my son. It's a wake-up call. He said, I knew that was it then. And so that's what worked for him. Gluten is an issue with a lot of people um, for a lot of reasons because wheat in our culture is kind of been turned into a franken food. And so it is very irritating to people's nervous system, to your gut microbes, to your immune system. It creates all kinds of inflammatory responses. And most people probably would do better off staying away from commercial wheat. If they stuck with like a heritage wheat, and then didn't use that as their only grain, you know, had a variety of grains in their diet, um, they would be better off. But our culture, if you look at products on the shelves, those products are all wheat. It's refined wheat, but it's all wheat. And it's very modern wheat that has been changed genetically way too much. And it's much, much higher in gluten than, look, if you were to get some heritage wheat and make yourself a loaf of bread, you're going to have this you know, compact, heavy, dense, really, yes, yes, you hit somebody over the head with it and you could do serious injury, exactly. Where if you take modern wheat and you make, and it's still whole wheat, it's all, full, you know, whole grain wheat, and you make a loaf of bread out of it, it's going to rise up because it's got probably twice as much or more gluten in it, and gluten is what makes it rise. And that's just because of the crossbreeding that we have done with wheat over the years. So it, that's why you see so many gluten sensitivities in our culture. It's not because we have like this overabundance of celiac. Yes, there are people in our culture who are celiac. It's just we have a lot of gluten sensitivities because we've toyed with our food too much. And so good for you? Yeah. No. Read your ingredients. Most gluten free products are white rice flour, which that right there is a downer. They have tapioca starch in them, potato starch, um, probably cornstarch, and that is, those are refined parts of those plants that are put in there. They're fillers. They're fillers to make something that's going to behave as close to wheat as possible so that people, it's palatable, you know, it, it looks good, it, it, uh, it, the texture and the taste, or the texture in your mouth, the taste is definitely different, but it's, it's creating products that make people happy. And if you read most of your gluten-free products, they're really pretty poor ingredients. There are ones out there, like brown rice bread, that you read the ingredients, and it's brown rice, maybe has a little honey or some sort of sugar in it, water, might have some eggs in it, and that's it. But you get into the ones that are made out of white rice flour, and they've got all those starches added to it, and guar gum, and carrageen, kind of like the stuff they throw in the fake Greek yogurt. It's just filler products that make it fluffy and nice, like people want things to be. But really bread is, I mean, if you ever go to Europe, I had a student when I was teaching in Canton, he was from Russia, and he said to me, one of the hardest things for him, this was a seventh grade boy, I was like, your bread in this country is awful, it's just this sticky, right, you know, just high rising, sticky, yucky, gross stuff. You know, and he's used to the heavy, <laughs> dense bread that's just got texture. You have to chew it. It doesn't just melt in your mouth. And so I would, every week or so, make him Russian black bread because he wanted something that felt like home. And I said, I, I know how to take care of you. He said, I'll make you 100% rye bread with molasses in it and beer, just like they make at home, because I like it too. And, you know, that you go, you go to Europe... A lot of places you go in Europe, if they're touristy places, and I've only been there once in my life, um, but if they're touristy places, they will cater to Americans, and they'll give you your fluffy white bread, and they'll give you all that stuff. But if you stay with German families, which I did, they feed you their hearty, hardcore, whole grain stuff that is like, yeah, it's amazing, it's good, it holds a lot of butter, it's perfect. <laughs>
I think we've pretty much covered things here. Basically, the raising of food. If it is raised as close to what it would raise itself in nature, if it was growing wild, it was animals and they're running around wild, it's got to be as close to nature as possible. And I always use um, salmon as an example. Um, we're told all the time wild salmon is really good for you. The reason wild salmon is really good for us is because that fish is living in its native environment. It is eating the food nature meant it to eat. And when organisms, be it plants or animals, fish, reptiles, when they are living the way nature intended them to live, in balance with nature, eating the foods nature intended them to eat, their bodies are in balance. Their metabolic chemistry profiles, whatever it is across the board, blood sugars, blood fat, triglycerides, cholesterol, it will be normal if you are living in balance with nature. So of course that fish is going to be fine. And if you put food into your body that was grown naturally and is in balance, it's not going to upset the balance of your body. Now if you are eating things in this commercial meat, commercial dairy, commercial eggs, cheese, if those animals were raised in poor environments, fed food that they were not meant to eat, cows being fed grain, their body profile is going to be out of balance. It's not going to be in the balance nature meant it to be because they're not eating and living in their natural way. Therefore, if you use their products, you're putting something into your body that's unbalanced. It cannot create homeostasis balance in you if it's not something that is balanced. And it's really a very simple equation. Um, sometimes I know it's a hard thing to hear because people say, difficult. You know, I've got to rethink the way I do everything. I've got to find sources of things. And it's, it's a process. And I always tell people, just one step at a time. Change one thing a week. Pull one processed food out of your cupboard every week. Look at it. What do I use this for? Do I really need this in my life? What could I replace it with that would be whole food? How could I make this for myself out of the whole food ingredients? Do I even need it? Can I survive without it? A box of crackers, a box of cereal. Can I survive without them? What can I bring into my life that's going to make me healthier? What can I invite in instead of worrying about what I'm getting rid of? Don't deprive yourself. Pull it in. Good stuff. Sure. Ah, we're getting to sugar. We are getting to sugar. Sugar. I love sugar. There's my animals out there running around doing what nature meant them to do, eating the bugs, the roots, the plants that nature meant them to eat. That's what animals are supposed to do. Okay, just want to keep track on time. Um, this is a whole grain. This is basically the shape of a whole wheat. Um, brown rice, rye, oats. Um, there's a lot of grains that are shaped in this elongated oval-like shape. Some are not. Some are round like millet, um, quinoa, amaranth, taff. Buckwheat is cute little almost heart-shaped thing. But their uh, basic anatomy is the same. On the outside of grain is the bran. That's where the fiber is. There's a lot of mineral type nutrients in that. Um, and then this is the germ here. This is the part of the plant that if you throw the seeds in the ground, once the moisture gets through the bran, the germ is what sprouts and creates a whole new plant. The endosperm is what is left when we refine things to make flour. We strip the bran off, we strip the germ out, and then we take this endosperm and we grind it up and we have refined flour. And if it's all-purpose, cake, enriched, bleached, unbleached, any of those names for flours are all refined flours. The bran is gone, the germ is gone, we've got the endosperm left which is basically carbohydrates and gluten. And that's where we get a lot of our issues with gluten is because we're taking the whole apart. We're not eating the whole. Um, you don't want to do that. You want to eat the whole. You can buy wheat germ, absolutely. And that's, again, they pull this apart. They throw the bran, wheat bran, they do it to oat as well. They throw that into a jar and sell it to you in a health food store because it's good fiber and they make a lot of money selling brand. They make a lot of money selling germ. Just leave it all together and eat it as a whole. And then you're getting all the nutrients laid out the way nature meant them to be laid out, and it's all good there. Um, but that's what they do to most 
um, grains, particularly wheat in our culture. When you're buying products that are made out of grain, it should say 100% whole grain. Whatever the grains are in it, it should say 100%. If it says on the label whole grain, it could have a teaspoon of whole grain in the whole batch of bread. So it's got to say 100% whole grain. Flip it over. Read your ingredients. Make sure the ingredients are good. Sugar. Brown sugar, white sugar, same thing. The very same thing. People like to think that when they use brown sugar, they're doing something healthy. Or if they see brown sugar on the label of ingredients, like in granolas and cereals, oh, it's got brown sugar in it. That's so much better. Okay, this has got to be a better product. Brown sugar is white sugar. They just mill it a little differently. It's a little thicker than the crystallized white sugar, and they put caramel coloring in it. They artificially color it. They throw in some other stuff. What's that? It does not. It does not. It used to. Real brown sugar does have molasses in it. The stuff you buy in the grocery store shelf, they've sucked the molasses out because they sell it to you in bottles called molasses, and you pay a higher price for that, and then they give you white sugar that's caramel colored. And people think it's brown sugar, and it's better for me, but it's not. Real brown sugar is sucanat, rapadura. If it says on the label, read what it says about the product, what it should say is that it's dehydrated cane juice. That means they press the cane juice out of the cane, sugar cane, and they just dehydrate it. Nothing has been taken out of it. Nothing has been added into it. Raw sugar, like the brown little packages you'll see in restaurants that's called raw sugar, what that is is they've stripped most of the molasses out. They've left a little, so it's got a little bit of a beige tinge to it. It's a step up from white sugar, but it is still basically refined sugar. They've taken most of the molasses out. If the molasses are still intact in it, you have this really, it's like whole grain flour, you have this really hearty sugar. And when you start using it, you will notice that, like if you made um, cookies that are like pastry dough, what do you call them? I'm blanking. Like little tea biscuit type cookies that are just vanilla-y. Or you made a vanilla cake. Most people, their idea of vanilla cake is this white-looking cake. If you use a sucanat sugar in it, and your cake is going to be a pale brown color, and then you're using whole grain flour on top of it, you are going to have this vanilla cake that looks brown. Um, and it tastes different because you will have the molasses taste in it. You, you can't get past that, but you get used to it. And then when you eat something that's made out of white flour and white sugar, like you go to Wegmans and you buy one of their grocery store cakes that has the Crisco frosting on top, you'll gag. You will absolutely gag. I won't waste my calories and my health eating something like that because I know how good things can taste. And that's like, they creep me out. And when my kids get invited to birthday parties and I know moms are going to a bakery and buying one of those sheet cakes, I'm like, oh, God, please don't eat it when you go, guys, please. Just don't even take a bite. Just walk away. Don't, don't eat that. Mom, all our friends are eating it. Okay, please just have a small piece. Please, you know, just think about what you're doing to your health. Which at 11 and 14 now, they care, but they don't care. What about things like the, uh, Stevia? If you're using stevia herb and it's green, it's like you're buying flakes of parsley, that is a whole product. It's very sweet. If you ever try to bake with that stevia herb, you have to use tiny amounts of it, so the texture of your product is going to be different. Because like if, if a cake calls for two cups of sugar, I always tell people immediately, cut it to one cup. Immediately cut the sugar in half, and then work your way down from there. But to get that kind of sweetness, you might need like a half a teaspoon to a teaspoon of the stevia. That's like this whole volume of sugar that's missing from the product, and it's gross. I've tried baking with stevia, which is gross. If it's great for sweetened teas, um, other liquidy things, like if you wanted to put it into pasta sauce, just sprinkles of it. Because some people like to put sugar in pasta sauce, just tiny sprinkles of it, because it's very strong. If you're using the stevia white powder or the clear liquid, it's totally refined. And I tell people to walk away. Don't bother with that. Very refined. Agave, not local. Um, and on top of it is a high fructose sugar. It's hard on the liver. It is not something that I would recommend to people. The easiest things to use are the sucanat and the rapadura and cut your sugar amounts in half. 
cut it in half, at least. Like if I'm making a cake that calls for two cups of sugar, I may use a half a cup of the sucanat. So that's really, I mean, it's cutting it, you know, by 75%. I do use maple syrup. If you use maple syrup in baking, one cup of maple syrup is equal to two cups of white sugar. So you already have to, to get to, if you're going to cut that white sugar to one cup, you have to use a half a cup of maple syrup. So you're, you're really using small amounts of maple syrup. Honey I never use in cooking. I read one time years ago in Ayurvedic medicine that when you heat honey, that's why I always tell people to buy local raw honey. It's never been heated. When you heat honey, it changes those healing properties of honey and it makes it something that's congesting in your body. So I have always raw local honey and I never use it in cooking. I was just going to say, that's the most I'll let people do with my raw honey in my house. You want to put it in your tea or your coffee, I'll let you do that. But beyond that, no, I just use it off the spoon. And I don't eat a lot of it. I mean, it's not like I'm sitting there eating spoonfuls of honey. Probably not hurting yourself. It's just refined. Right. It's just a refined thing. So if you're using the stevia leaves, the green stuff, you're going to get the nutrients that are in that. When you're using that clear liquid, you're just not getting the nutrients. And you wouldn't notice it. No, you wouldn't notice But go small. Because if you put a lot in, I was making, like I make gallons of tea at a time, like nettle and raspberry leaf tea and that kind of stuff for their healing teas. I grabbed out of, I have big glass gallon jars of herbs in them, and I thought I was grabbing a handful of nettles, which the handful probably ends up being close to a cup of the herbs, but it was a big pot. I was making probably a gallon and a half of tea, and I grabbed this handful of stevia because I grabbed the wrong jar out of the cupboard, and I was reaching in and grabbing. And then I let the pot sit on the stove overnight and steep, and in the morning, I always strain it, and then I have gallon, gallon and a half of tea to drink during the week. That it's good high mineral teas for bones, teeth, hair, all that kind of stuff. But in the morning, when I strained it, I poured some in the glass again. And I was like aghast. It was like syrupy, sweet, sickening. I used it to water my plants because I immediately realized, I was like, oh my God, what did I do? Oh my God, I grabbed the stevia, and so I just used it to water the plants. And I'm sure my plants. You can buy the green powder, yes. But if, and, and I'm not even sure, that's one thing I didn't notice out here, is if they have a section that's bulk herbs, and I'm sure they probably do, where you can buy all kinds of um, medicinal herbs as well as cooking herbs, they probably have stevia in one of those jars, and you can buy like just a little ounce baggie of it. No, you don't need much. Pinch it. Pinch it. Don't overdo it. Cleaning out the kitchen. Like I said before, one product at a time. Find something to replace it. Evaluate if you really need it in your house. All the things to clean out, and it's basically what we've been talking about. Um, this one right here, and I remember this as a kid, you know, it was breakfast cereal. Because it's enriched and fortified with 11 central minerals and blah, blah, blah. We always thought that was a good thing. Well, if they're enriching and fortifying a product, that product had nothing of nutritional value to begin with, nothing to put on the label. So now we're dumping the synthetic vitamins and minerals in it, so it looks like, wow, you know, what a nutritional powerhouse. If it says enriched and fortified, you know what it was in there originally is just garbage, and don't buy it. All the things to look for, and this is certainly not an all-inclusive list, but hydrogenated, partially hydrogenated oils, corn syrup, high fructose corn syrup, and artificial colors and flavors, and one that stumps people is a lot of times vanillin, which is a synthetically, petrochemically produced fake vanilla. It's used in a lot of products because it's a lot cheaper. Vanilla is an expensive product that only comes from two small places in the world. Um, and people trip up on that because your eye catches it and you don't notice that it's not vanilla. That is it's just a nasty, nasty petrochemical product. Preservatives, fructose, glucose, maltose, dextrose, any of those oses, that's sugar that's added to your product. And oftentimes, 
highly sweet product will have a lot of different forms of sugar in it because if it just said sugar as the second ingredient, people get scared because they like they know that's like the second most you know abundant ingredient. And so if it's just peppered throughout it, all these different oses, you don't realize that really this product is mostly sugar. Oses are sugar. Where do you find good food? Good stores, the backyard growing it, farmers markets, CSAs, which is a community supported agriculture. You buy a share of the farm, the farm gives you food every week. Um, it's a great way to go. Some of these things up here are local for the parts of Potsdam area, like Garden Share is a local organization we have that keeps a local food guide. And I'm sure there's one here in this area, local food guide of who all the farmers are in the area and what they produce. And you can just whip through the pages and you can find out who's producing all kinds of produce, meat, dairy products, organic wine. It's all, all in the book. Um, and again, those farm stands down the road don't like don't not stop. Check it out because you could have somebody right down the road from you that's growing wonderful food. Just ask them how they grow it. So you can round up. Don't buy from them. <laughs> and the other way to buy good food is a food buying club, and there are plenty of them in this area. They buy bulk amounts of food from United Food Company, um, Tree of Life, Frontier. They're big cooperatives that sell like natural peanut butter, whole grain, baking supplies, and you can buy them in bulk quantities. And you can get, like say, I'll, for an example, a case of almond butter, 12 one-pound jars of almond butter, organic raw almond butter. If I bought that case off the shelf, it would cost me probably 200 and some dollars. If I buy it through a group buying club, the case would probably cost me somewhere between 140 and 100 Almond butter is still expensive, but it's a whole lot cheaper to buy things like that by the case. If you Google food buying club, it, yes, you will find people in the area that do it. And another one is whole share. Oh, they don't. And they do a buying club? Um, I don't know if they're a buying club. They might do, but they're definitely in the The other thing to look up is Whole Share. Whole Share is a community-based group buying club that you can order online. And somebody in the area is like the drop-off point that the stuff is dropped off there, and then you have to pick it up on the day that it's delivered. That's Whole Share. Make food and art. Play with your food. Try new things. If it turns out yucky, Eat it. Be grateful. Have gratitude for it. And then pitch the rest in the compost pile so you'll never make that dish again. But I have made some really lousy things that have turned out. One thing I like to play with in the wintertime with root vegetables, grating them up into um, just like a raw root vegetable slaw with cabbage and stuff in it. I like to play with different spices in it. And some of them are a hit with my kids. Some aren't. Like I want, you know, mixed cinnamon and ginger and cardamom and nutmeg and that kind of thing. And as long as I keep the spice level low in it, but I like lots of nutmeg, kids didn't. So I had this big bowl that I made of like beet, carrot, parsnip, and cabbage, you know, slaw type thing. I ended up eating it all myself. Uh, also making soups and stews, like root vegetable soups and stews. I thought, that'd be really cool. Let's, you know, put cinnamon, nutmeg, cardamom, ginger, a little vanilla in it, kind of make it a, a fun, warming spice type of thing. That's what you put in muffins. You don't put it in root vegetables, too. So I ate that. <laughs> um, and then I always tell people this because I always get told, oh, it's expensive to eat healthy. It is expensive to eat healthy. But if you invest in your health now, you are not going to be keeping your doctor wealthy later. And that's, that's where you want to go. And healthy prevention is definitely worth that kind of cure. And then my last thing I always tell you, grateful for everything that you have because there are times in life where you're not going to have the best choices available to you because you're not at home, you're at a friend's house, family member who loves you right to death and everything they made for you even though it's not the greatest whole foods, they made it out of love, eat it. You're not going to die 
your daily diet is going to be better, and it'll pull your cells right back to health tomorrow when you go back to your whole food. Or you're traveling. Traveling, I find, is hard because the food generally is lousy. If I know I'm going somewhere, like particularly urban area, so you know there's going to be good organic restaurants that have local food, I will Google that area before I go there because I am not going to go there blind, not knowing what's available. I want to know where I can go and get good food, and I'll get to Google Map and everything, and I will like contact them and ask them what they cook and how they cook it. I want to know that I'm, you know, I'm just okay, good, I can go there and I can get good food. Like in a couple of weeks, I'm going to Montreal to see the Eagles in concert, and I've wanted to do this all my life. I know, Amy. <laughs> I am so excited, you know, and I'm disgusted that I paid $215 for the ticket because I think that's outrageous, but I cannot wait to see the Eagles. And I'm like, okay, I am not going up there unless I am in a restaurant in Montreal that's going to serve me good food. And I want to know when I can go for dinner, which is Sunday night. I want to know where I can go for breakfast. And until I have that down, I'm not pulling out of the driveway. I got it set. I even went on TripAdvisor and I asked people about restaurants that I found in the Montreal area. Okay, I'm good. I can get good food there. I can go see the Eagles now. <laughs> and one of the comments I got from somebody was, well, they don't have very good beer at this restaurant, though. I'm okay. I'm good with that. <laughs> I just want good food. But always be grateful, because if you're sitting there eating those things at family that is not so great food, and you're just thinking, oh my God, I'm killing myself, that thought process is far worse than the food you're putting in your body. Go at it with gusto, with gratitude, and return that love to the person who made it for you. And I have I, like clients who bring me things, and they don't bring me the greatest things. You know, they'll bring, they bake bread, and it's like sour bread. I have a neighbor who, God bless this man, I love him right to death. He picks wild berries for me all summer. He picks wild grapes in the fall. But he was a baker by trade, and he brings me the most disgusting white flour rolls. I still have some that he brought me for Christmas last year in the freezer, and I can't throw them out because he's such a sweet old man. And yet my kids are like, when are you going to throw those in the compost? I can't because I don't even want that refine food in my compost. It's going to screw up the microorganisms that are breaking down my compost. I'll feed them to Grandpa. That's all he eats is white flour anyhow. We'll just take them to Grandpa. You know, I can't change him now, so. But, like, I just can't do that because I know they were made with complete love. So, someone will eat them. Gratitude. Always good gratitude. Questions?